Is that what God's saying? Is he telling you to keep going? Are you sure this is where he has you? Does he want you doing this? And you're like, well, that sounds scary. That sounds like I've got to always be talking with him. Yes. Could you imagine if the last time you talked to your wife, men, was 10 years ago? Well, last time we talked, we were supposed to move here, so I moved here. I haven't seen her in 10 years, but I'm here. We talked about it. She agreed this is what we were doing. I suppose I should call her and see what she's up to. It's that crazy to not daily walk with the Lord. Welcome to Life Point Church. We are glad you're here. What an incredible time of worship. All right, so we're going to be diving in and talking about a prophet this morning that points us towards Christ, of course, the series from creation to Christ. And he points in such a unique, amazing way that him and only one other person in the history of the world is described and put in this same category. Actually, he has this unique position in two different areas of life right? And he doesn't even have his own book in the Bible. Isn't that crazy? We're not talking about Jeremiah or Daniel. We're not looking at Isaiah or Ezekiel or Obadiah. Who are we talking about? Elijah. Now, who of you were in the empowered women's class this morning? Raise your hand. Okay, so we've got about half a dozen of you. Oh, maybe some more. I would like to think, and I'm sure you're going to think this, that my wife and I are so connected that she taught out of Romans 11 today, right? And if you know Romans 11, it talks about Elijah and the remnant of the 7,000. And Paul uses that to talk about the Gentiles and the incorporation of the church into the Jewish church and everything that God's doing. We did not know what each other were talking about until 8 a.m., 8.30 a.m. this morning when she said, I'm talking about Elijah. And I'm like, I'm talking about Elijah. And she's like, well, I'm in Romans 11, so I'm talking about 1 Kings 19. And I go, I'm reading 1 Kings 19 this morning. And so if we needed confirmation that the word of the Lord is for you this morning, the Lord put it on multiple hearts, and then we did even talk to each other. So uh, it's going to be good. For over 100 years, the Israelites lived under the rule of three kings, Saul, David, and Solomon. These would be the first three kings of the nation of Israel. At the death of Solomon, Israel would have a civil war and they would be divided. Ten tribes would go to the northern kingdom, which would retain the name Israel, and the other two would be called the southern kingdom or Judah. In this time and from the beginning of the division until Israel's captivity, the northern kingdom during roughly 200 years had 19 kings or monarchs. And all of them, all 19, what does the Bible say they were? Wicked men. Not one good one. The whole bunch was rotten. All of them. And then we get to the southern kingdom. And the southern kingdom, they had 300 years because they weren't taken captive by the Babylonians until later. They had 17 monarchs over the course of 300 years. And eight of them, it says, followed Jehovah and his ways and the other nine did wickedness in the sight of the Lord. And in 586 B.C., Jerusalem was destroyed and they would be taken captivity by the Babylonians. So we want to look at today, I say all this because often kings can be a confusing book. Um, There's there's so many names of kings going back and forth and if you don't understand the northern southern kingdom thing, sometimes you're like, wait, I thought this guy was the king during this time. So we today are going to be looking at the eighth king in the northern kingdom of Israel, okay? First Kings chapter 19. Turn to First Kings chapter 19. If you don't have a Bible, grab one underneath the seat in front of you. First Kings comes shortly after Deuteronomy, so you can just sort of work your way towards it from there. And we're looking at chapter 19. We're looking at the eighth king. His name is Ahab. And by the time we get to Ahab, he has this description of him. He was more wicked than any of the other kings who came before him. Now, that actually says that about every king. As you read, what what the author is trying to get across is that Israel was going deeper and deeper away from Jehovah and not drawing nearer to him. And as each king's successor came into power, they did more and more evil in the sight of the Lord until you get to Ahab. Ahab is so evil... How evil is he, Pastor? (laughs) That they mention his wife's name. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm waiting. People are like, oh, gosh, where's he going with this? It's 2024. He actually had a real sweetheart of a wife, a real wonderful lady. Does anyone know her name? Yes. <laughs> yes. She's a real Jezebel. That's where we get the name, and that name comes from her. She sort of, and I don't mean by sort of, I mean she was the embodiment of a demonic spirit. It's the only time we see, leading up to Ahab, that the wife's name is given, and there's two reasons for that. One, she really is the one who ran the kingdom, and two, she brought the worship of the god Bel and Bel's mother, Asherah, as the national worship of Israel. She's the one who brought that into power. Now, prior to her, of course, there's always other pagan religions amongst, amongst the tribes, but she made it the national religion. She made it and put it up in all the high places and put all the statues and idols and everything you could set up, and she's, she's the one who proclaimed, this will be Israel's God. So, God's not too happy with this, and he decides to send in his man. And in chapter 17 of 1 Kings, we get an, un, an introduction to his man through, the, through a guy named Elijah. So, because we don't have time to walk through 17 and 18, and it is chock full of so much stuff that you could do an entire series on two chapters, I'm going to walk through the history. So, as I begin to talk about 19, where we will be today, and the word the Lord has for you today, I'm not just talking this, I'm not talking about a story that I've pulled out of thin air. So, so far, are you with me? Which kingdom are we in? Northern. Northern. Which king are we talking about? What's his wife's name? Is she good or bad? bad? All right, you are with me. Wonderful. In comes Elijah. We don't get any other background. It's just Elijah the Tishbite came in, walked straight up to Ahab and goes, there will be no rain and no dew on the ground for years to come until I say so. Peace. And he literally walks out. This is 1 Kings 17. Could you imagine that? Now, the king hears this, and you have to sort of be like, whatever. Who are you? Who are you to tell me this? But that's what he does, and he leaves. He doesn't stay. You would think that God would have him stay in the city, and then as things were getting bad and the drought was getting worse, he'd be like, hey, king, are you ready to repent now? But he doesn't. God has him leave and tells him, I want you to go by the river Kareth, or the brook. It's a small brook, and you're going to stay there. And uh, I'm going to have my ravens bring meat to you, and you will eat each day. Like a king eats, you will eat meat. This is weird. This is really weird. This had to be even weird for Elijah. And so he does this, and for the better part of three and a half years, he spends by this little brook until ultimately the brook dries up, and it no longer gives water. And the Lord says, okay, I want you to go back into town now. I'm not going to go to Ahab yet. I want you to go to this widow's house. And so he goes to the widow's house in Kareth. No, not Kareth. Kapareth? Kapertini? Zeripoth. I was so way off. <laughs> Zeripoth. <laughs> he goes to the widow's house in Zeripoth, and he says, can I have a room here? And I would like you to make me a cake. And she says, sir, you have come at a bad time. I have just enough flour and just enough oil to make one more cake that my son and I were going to split, and then we were going to die. That was literally her plan. They were so emaciated and so out of resources. And you got to remember, by this time, it's been three and a half years. No water in the region. And this is a desert region. This isn't a jungle. It's a desert region. God even took the dew from the ground. So they couldn't even collect the dew off the ground. There was nothing for three and a half years which means there would have been dead crops, there would have been dead animals lying in the streets, there would have been dead bodies. The city was a mess. And he comes to this widow's home, says, may I have this? She tells him her plan, and he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and make me a cake, bread, and then you can make your, and your son one, and I will tell you this now, that the flour and the oil will not run out in those jars until the rains come. And so she does as he says. She gives him a room in her place, and he stays there for a season. We don't know exactly how long, but he stays there for a season. And as he's staying there in this widow's home, her son dies, just dies. And she brings him to him, and she's like, how? How did you let this happen? Right? And she's sort of blaming him, which is funny because he was already going to die 
And she was all ready for him to die, but now he's eaten and he's gotten his health back, but then he dies. And so Elijah takes the son up to his room. It says he lays him on the bed. He goes before the Lord. He prays over him, lays over him seven times, right? And on the seventh one, is it seven times or three times? Three times. Seven times is what he does later with the praying for the cloud up in heaven. So many numbers. I'm trying to do this from memory. Mostly I'm there. Prays over him three times. On the third time, the boy wakes up. He brings him down to the mother and says, your child's healed. And she says, for sure, I know now you are a prophet of God. So this leads to uh, Elijah going back to King Ahab. It's time. God says, it's time to go. And he confronts him, and he says, hey, what's up? (laughs) This is great. Actually, I should read this for you because this is so chill and so just like, really, that's all he did. So Obadiah went to meet, so he has Obadiah go and get Ahab for him. He's like, hey, dude, and this is another prophet who's a faithful man of God. He's like, would you go get the king for me? And Obadiah's like, nope, I don't want to do that because if you're not here when I get back, he's going to kill me. He has been looking for you for three and a half years, and he has the whole city looking for you, and they all want you dead because of what you've done to this place. Elijah says, don't worry, I'm going to be here. Go get him. So when he saw Elijah, Ahab, he said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? Elijah replied, I have not made trouble for Israel. It is you and your father's family that have done this. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the bells. So I want you to do something, Ahab. I want you to summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah. Asherah was Baal's mommy. I'm just being real. That's what she was. She had a pole you worshipped. He had a physical thing you worshipped. And uh, and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word through all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. And Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And so what we have here is the coolest showdown of all time. I am convinced Clint Eastwood, before he made any westerns, John Wayne read this story and said, wow, that is epic. He says, here's what we're going to do. We're each going to build a sacrifice and altar to our gods, and then we're each going to take a bull and cut him up and place it on him. And then you have to ask your God to consume the sacrifice in fire. And then I will ask my God, and we'll see who wins, right? It's the ultimate sh- showdown. And if you know the story, you know what happens. If you don't, I will briefly run through it real quick. They dance around, and they chant, and nothing happens. Shocking. And then they begin to cut themselves, and they begin to yell louder. Elijah, after noon, begins to taunt them, which when you think of a man of God and you see these pictures of the men of God, you're like, oh, they would never have done that. He taunts them. He actually begins to make fun of them and their God, so much so as he asks them, maybe he is on the toilet, relieving himself. That's literally what the translation is. Perhaps he is relieving himself. And so once they hear that, then they begin to yell louder, and they begin to cut themselves. So you have these prophets of Baal who are worn out. It says they did this all day until evening when Elijah finally said, all right, that's enough. They have blood out all over the place. They're probably completely wiped out. And Elijah says, it's my turn. He then asks for four pitchers or barrels of water to be poured over the sacrifice so that they would know that there's no funny business going on. It pours so much water over it that it fills the trench around the altar. And in 30 seconds, less than 30 seconds, he lifts up his voice, prays to the Lord, and it says, fire consumed the altar. Now, often we think like a meteor or a fireball came down from heaven, but uh, more aptly, what happened is it came up sort of from the ground and consumed the altar, and the fire shot so high it shot like into heaven. But the fire was so hot that it not only consumed the wood and the bull, but it consumed the rocks and the dirt. Rocks. That there was nothing left in that place but a scorched black earth. And then he looks and he says, who's God now? And all the Israelites, it's, it's, it's Jehovah, Jehovah's God. And he goes, okay, now let's kill all 850 of Baal's prophets. And they're like, yes, sir. And they slaughter all of them right there 
on Mount Carmel. Kind of brutal. Elijah then takes his servant and goes to the top of Mount Carmel. I'm guessing they were on a little plateau. Goes to the top, and he begins to pray for the rain. It's time for God to bring rain. And so this is where he bows down seven times. Each time he's doing it, he asks his servant to go and look and see if the clouds are forming. The servant says nothing. On the seventh time, the servant says there's a small cloud the size of a man's hand, and he says, then we best get going, and we need to tell Ahab he needs to hurry and head back to Jezreel, not Jezebel, Jezreel, the city where his uh, home was, palace, and, uh, because there's a rain coming. There's a storm coming. And sure enough, black clouds begin to fill the sky, and they says, get on your chariot and head home before the storm comes, or you aren't going to be able to make it home. And then it says he tucks his cloak into his belt, and he just takes off running. And that is how we end 1 Kings 18, okay? I want you to keep this in your mind because where we're about to read is going to make no sense. He has just had the ultimate victory. He has just, in the face of his enemy and by the power of God, destroyed his enemy. And now he's even had the people rise up and they helped slay the prophets of Baal. You would think that this is the victory that he has been waiting for. God is moving just as he had hoped, and God is going to redeem his people and his land. So let's read 1 Kings 19, starting in verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done. I can just picture him just sort of laying down on her lap, crying as she strokes his head. And then, and then he killed all of them. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I have not made your life like one of those prophets. So she sends the ultimate death threat. Verse 3, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. (laughs) Wait a minute. (laughs) You just faced the king and 850 of his prophets and by the power of God called fire onto this altar and it consumed everything. And now you get a death threat from this demonic woman and you're like, that's it, I'm out. I'm done. I can't do it anymore, God. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey out into the wilderness. Why did he leave his servant there? He was ready to die. You'll find that out here. While he himself went a day's journey, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the bush and fell asleep. How do you go from the champion of champions to within a few days, however long it took for Ahab to get back to Jezreel and then for the message to get back out to um, Elijah, to not just, oh, this stinks, to literally saying, I'm done, Lord. I have left my servant in Beersheba. You can give him to another prophet. I'm done. How does that happen? What I want us to see here today, and this is the main point of what I'm talking about here today, is that what's going on in Elijah's life is not an accident. It's not an anomaly. In fact, every single one of us go through it in various times and seasons of our life. And this week, for many of us, we may have had a very similar type of thing with the election. Either you were super happy or you're super sad. Some of you are happy and sad, right? I personally am sad that Prop 139 passed, and it's frustrating, and it's a letdown, and there was a lot of stuff between pastors and a lot of hope, but the Lord is still in charge, and He'll have His way. And so here we have our our man, the man's man, Elijah, goes to the tree, middle of nowhere, falls down, says, God, take me home, I'm done, and then goes to sleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then laid down again. Then the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey ahead is too much for you. So he got up, ate, and drank, and strengthened by that food, he would travel for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached 
Horeb, the mountain of God, or Mount Sinai. That's also Mount Sinai, another name for Mount Sinai. Where is with, who met with God at Mount Sinai? Moses. That's where God met with Mount Sinai. I mean, that's where God met with Moses at Mount Sinai. Once he got to Mount Sinai, there he went into a cave and he spent the night. He's doing a lot of sleeping, by the way. I suppose after that, what he experienced, he was probably pretty wiped out physically. The Lord then appears to Elijah. Okay, so now this is the Lord. This isn't an angel of the Lord anymore, okay? It's important to note. It's no longer an angel of the Lord. This is the Lord. Appears to Elijah, and the word of the Lord came to him, and he asks him, what are you doing here, Elijah? This is why I love the Bible. Can we appreciate this for a minute? God told Elijah, it's time to go to Ahab. Tell him there'll be no water. He gives the message. What do I do now, God? Go down to the brook by Kareth, and you're going to stay there until I tell you. The brook dries up. What do I do now, God? Go to the widow who's in the city. she have a place for you. So he goes to the widow. After a certain time there, it's time to go to Ahab. We're going to have a showdown on Mount Carmel. Once you get there, here's what you're going to do. Every part of the way, God tells him where to go and what to do. But now he's gotten this death threat from this demonic Jezebel, and he's so scared out of his mind, he's so full of fear, and all the courage that he just had, all of the pride that he just had in making fun of the prophets of Baal is gone. And it's not been replaced with humility, it's been replaced with terror, fear, anxiety, depression. And so he goes out in the wilderness. And this is what I love about the Lord. What, what we would probably do with one of our children in a similar situation is you, you would s- sort of tend to scold them. What are you doing? Get up. This is not okay. He was essentially throwing a temper tantrum, right? I, take me now, God. Kill me now. I can't do this anymore. I'm all alone. I don't want to do it. What does the Lord do? The Lord bakes him a cake, gives him some water, lets him sleep. He eats and then lets him sleep again. The Lord recognizes he needs rest, and the Lord gives him the rest. He doesn't bring up what's just happened. He doesn't say, tell me why you're out here. Explain yourself. The Lord says, I love you. I want to give you rest, and he gives him rest. But we never see God tell him to go to Mount Sinai. Now, Sinai, from where he was, is about 250 miles away. Now, nowadays, that'd be a day's journey, half a day's journey, but ultimately takes him 40 days, 40 nights to get there. Gets there, goes to sleep again, and the first question God Almighty asks him is, Elijah, what are you doing here? I love that. God's like, I didn't call for you. I didn't tell you to come here. What are you doing here? So Elijah replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altar and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. So the Lord said, I want you to go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. So God answers him and says, okay, I hear you. Go, go stand outside. Get out of this dark cave. <laughs> go get some light. As he did this, a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. Can we just appreciate that for a second before we move past it? He's standing on the side of a mountain, and a wind so fierce that it rips rocks in half. This is intense. Then, if that wasn't enough, a wind, an earthquake comes and it shakes the ground. But it says the Lord was not in the wind and the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a giant fire came, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Why does it repeat itself? Have you ever wondered this? Didn't he already ask him this? And Elijah's going to give him the same exact answer he just gave him. Have you ever asked yourself, why does he repeat himself? Why did he do this whole big, awe-inspiring show of hurricane and earthquake and fire? Why? Only to not be in any of those things, but to be in the gentle whisper. 
The answer to the question I'm asking is more profound than you know. It is the very answer to our walk with God. It is the very essence of what should give you the power and the courage to go out into the world tomorrow, this afternoon, and to share Jesus with anyone he brings in front of you. That's how powerful the answer to this question is. Why did he do this only to ask him the same question? What Elijah got caught up in was his own plan and his own program, right? He gets time away from the Lord. He becomes a more humble man, but not humble enough. Where's your God, on the toilet? Still a bit of pride left in our boy Elijah. And because he is so all in on this plan and he is so all in on this magnificent display of God's power, he's like, yes! Now it's time. Now we ride back into Jezreel. We kill Ahab and Jezebel, or they repent, fall on their knees, accept Jehovah as God, confess their sins, and God rebuilds the city. These are what he had in his mind. This is what's going to happen. But what happens? The people go back. Nobody takes Ahab or Jezebel out of power. They just sort of all go back to their daily lives after they've just seen this amazing thing. And rather than repent, Jezebel calls for his head and says, you will be dead by tomorrow night. And so you got to understand this. Not only is she a demonic woman and who has lots of power, but she also has the army of Israel at her control. So it's not just like she was going to come find him. She was going to send the army after him. And so his plan has failed. God's plan, he feels, has failed. I was it, God. I was your last hope for your people, and now look, not even that worked. I can't do it anymore, God. They're too dumb. They just don't get it. Think about this. What takes you from that high to laying under a tree in the desert ready to die? Your plan failed, and God didn't uphold it, and you're upset. And that's what he's doing here. He's upset. And so God, in his graciousness, knows my boy needs sleep and he needs food. So I'm going to give him those things. Oh, look, he's coming to the place that he knows that I met with Moses face to face. He's probably wanting to meet with me as well. I'm going to ask him what he's doing here. And then I'm going to show him that although I use the wind, the earthquake, and the fire, I reserve those for my judgments. I reserve those for my judgment. The fire upon the sacrifice was the judgment of God against Baal, Ahab, and the prophets. It was the judgment that you can't even conjure up a spark, and the Lord God conjures up a fire so hot it destroys everything covered in water. What he wants Elijah to see is the same thing he wants you and I to see, is that although he uses the earthquake and the wind, he uses the fire. He is the gentle voice. And we always want him to come in fire and power against our enemies. Don't we? Come take them down, God. Take the wicked people down in this country. Take the wicked lying leaders down. Right? And I get that. That's what they've been wanting him to do for a long time. And God says, Elijah, I'm not in any of those things, was I? I'm in the voice. Elijah, you thought I was going to be in that big, expansive display, and you thought that was the end of evil men in Israel, and you thought that was the beginning of paradise. Elijah, I have so much going on. I have a plan so big your mind couldn't even comprehend it if I begin to tell it to you. I need you to seek my voice. Elijah, if you would have come to me after the rains and gotten on your knees and said, Lord, what next? The queen is coming after my life. I would have spoke to you. I would have showed you what's next. But you were so sure you had life figured out. You were certain that this, was good, this giant, miraculous event was going to be the thing that turned the hearts of the people around. The miracles aren't what turn the hearts around. The voice of God is what turns the hearts around. And they need to hear the voice of God. The miracles may lead them to the voice, but ultimately it's the words 
of our Lord that captures our heart and brings us into relationship. And so he, he asks him, after he gives this incredible illustration, Elijah, you need to seek my voice, not my miracles. Elijah, seek my voice, not the miracles. Seek my presence, not the miracles. He's going to ask him the same question. Elijah, I ask you again, what are you doing here? I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword, and I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me too. It's word for word, same thing. And then the Lord said to him, this is so, so awesome. I want you to go back the way you came. <laughs> you just traveled for 40 days and 40 nights, and the Lord's like, I need you to turn around. I need you to head back the way you came. We do this with our children, right, when they're younger and they come into your bedroom at night, and they're like, oh, I'm scared. And you're like, go back, turn around, go back to your bedroom and go to bed. Do not come in here again, right? We just, you got to send them back. You love them, but they shouldn't be here right now. <laughs> That's like what God's doing to Elijah. I love you, but why are you here, Elijah? I want you to go back, go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, I want you to anoint Hazel king over Aram. Aram, my friends, is Syria. That is a pagan king in a pagan nation, and nowhere in the rest of any scripture does it tell us that this man ever became a believer or a worshiper of Jehovah. You want me to go anoint a pagan king? Yep. And then I want you to anoint... Uh, Jehu, uh, Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And when you're done there, I've got a friend I want to give you. You need a friend, Elijah. You have been alone way too long, and you need a friend. And so I'm gonna, I want you to anoint a man named Elisha, the son of Shaphat from Abel Mehola, to succeed you as a prophet. He will be your apprentice. And here's the deal. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazel, and Elijah will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet, Elijah, I heard you say something twice to me. You said you're the only one left who worships me. I have reserved 7,000 in Israel who have not bowed their knee or kissed the idol of Baal. I have 7,000 you don't even know about. Why is he doing this? Why say this? To remind Elijah to remind you and I today that you cannot allow your plans to get in the way of God's. And God's plans, oh my goodness, will not make sense to you. Wouldn't it be weird if they always made sense? If you're always like, oh yeah, I would have done that, God. I'd be a God I don't want to worship. If it's something you would have done, no offense, I'm sure you're great, but I don't want a God who always does what you think is right. And so often what he tells us to do is going to seem crazy. It's going to feel impossible. But we know that with God, all things are possible. Elijah teaches us that even when you are doing good things and you're doing good work for the Lord, you need to take time regularly, daily, to get in the secret place, to listen for his voice, to seek his voice. Because if you don't, you'll miss the next turn. And you'll keep heading down the road of the last instruction he gave you. And before you know it, you'll be in the middle of the wilderness somewhere asking God to kill you. Right? His plans are always moving and changing. He's moving and working in ways we can't know. So don't think because he gave you a word 10 years ago about something, and if you haven't heard him speak in 10 years, you better stop for a moment and you better check and see if you're still on the right road. Right? Doesn't that make sense? Not, well, no giant disaster has befallen me yet, so I'm just going to keep going. Is that what God's saying? Is he telling you to keep going? Are you sure this is where he has you? Does he want you doing this? And you're like, well, that sounds scary. That sounds like I've got to always be talking with him. Yes! <laughs> Could you imagine if the last time you talked to your wife, men, was 10 years ago? Well, last time we talked, we were supposed to move here, so I moved here. I haven't seen her in 10 years, but I'm here. We talked about it. She agreed this is what we were doing. I suppose I should call her and see what she's up to. <laughs> it's that crazy. 
It's that crazy to not daily walk with the Lord. And our problem that was Elijah's problem is still here today. We see it in our elections because those are front and center in front of us is ultimately my program, my plan will fix the world. The problem with the world is you aren't following my program. The Democrats have one, the Republicans have one. Even amongst us Christians, we look at the other churches and the other denominations and we're like, oh, you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a good church, you aren't really worshiping God. And then the Presbyterians look and they go, oh, too much emotionalism, you don't spend time in the doctrine, you don't know the true God. And we say, you aren't following my program, therefore you aren't following God. And God says, I have so many programs going on, you don't even know what you're talking about. I want you to go anoint a pagan king. What? Yep, you're going to anoint him. So he comes under the fold of Israel? Nope. You don't hear anything about him again. Are you hearing me? That's crazy. Why would you just go anoint this dude? God's like, there's a whole plan that goes with it. you got to trust me. Edmund Clowney, great name, is a Bible scholar, and he talks about this in Matthew 11, when John the Baptist comes and says, how do we know that you're the one who is to come? This is, I'm closing with this, this is how I tied Jesus into it. How do we know that you're the one to come? Remember that? He's in jail, and he begins to hear Jesus is doing all these miracles, and he tells his disciples, John the Baptist tells his disciples, go ask my cousin... <laughs> Why has he not let me out of jail? And ask him if we should be waiting for another Messiah. We know Jesus' response, and maybe you knew or didn't know this, but Jesus doesn't just respond how he responds out of thin air. He quotes Isaiah 35. He's quoting Isaiah 35 when he says, John, don't you know the deaf hear, the blind see, the poor have the good news preached, and the lame walk? He's wanting to turn John, John's attention back to the Scripture and say, everything is happening. But here's the part that drove John crazy. John came in the spirit of who? Elijah. Well done. He came in the spirit of Elijah. Elijah's a man who got things done. Elijah's a man who wanted to see justice and retribution and vengeance. And John came with that same spirit. Why do you think he went to the king and said, stop sleeping with your brother's wife? Who does that? John does that. Elijah would have done that. Why is he doing that? And why is he mad that Jesus isn't overthrowing Rome and setting him free? Here's why. What does Isaiah 35 actually say? If you sum up the message of Isaiah 35, that's what I'm going to do here for you now. Strengthen the feeble hands and steady the knees that give way. Your God will come, and he will come in what? Vengeance with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf be unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Do you see now why so many of the Jews missed it? Because they missed the message of Elijah the prophet. I'm not in all of that crazy stuff. I use it for my purposes. But if you want to find me, listen for my voice. Right? Listen. And so Israel was waiting for the vengeance and the divine retribution, and they're like, yes, where is it? And John's like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I get you're doing all the miracles. You're the guy. Where's the vengeance? And God essentially is saying, you don't understand, John. If my father comes down in justice to give the world vengeance, he's not just taking out Rome and Herod and all those who oppress Israel. He's going to take out every single one of you because there's none of you who have lived a life worthy of the calling. There's none of you who have done enough good to be in the presence of an all-righteous God. John, you don't know what you're asking for. But you know what? The prophet Isaiah was fulfilled because when Jesus came, the vengeance and the retribution of God did come down on this earth, but it didn't land on man. It landed on Jesus. The earth shook when he died. He went and braved the fires of hell. And the winds came and ripped the curtain in half between the Holy of Holies and the presence of God. 
Jesus took the judgment upon himself. The wrath of God came just as it was predicted it would come. We were just a little short-sighted as people believing it would come on our current enemies and not realizing it was going to come on our main enemy, sin. And the judgment came upon Christ, and sin was forgiven, and sin, the debt had been paid, and now Jesus says, come and receive it. It's right here. It's for you. Come and receive my voice. And that's my encouragement for you today. There's been a lot of hate and divisiveness and stuff going on. And sometimes we get in our prayers and we stop listening to the Lord. And we're just asking and talking and we're asking for justice and we're asking for our way to be done and this and that. And there is Christian, we we need to make sure we're still in line with what God has called us to do. Some of you, God is moving out of this place. Some of you, God is moving into different positions here in this church, but you don't know it because you're waiting for the big miraculous sign, the writing in the sky, the voice of God booming down. And God says, come and sit at my feet. Listen. What does wisdom do? Proverbs tells us. She shouts in the street. God is wisdom. He shouts his answers to us if we would take the time to sit and listen, if we would give his voice the worth, remember what worth means, weight, if we would give it the weight in our life it deserves, you would have such a clear picture of what God is wanting you to do. And that's what the world needs. In what the coming months and years have for us, the world needs a church of men and women who are not only moving and moved to uh, excitement when the miraculous happens around them, but who are daily spending time seeking the voice of the Lord. When you have that, watch what happens to this church. When we begin to seek the voice of the Lord above everything else, trust me, Christian, watch what happens to the church. God is going to do things so much greater than engulfing stones and sticks with fire. Why don't I see miracles? Why don't I feel the presence of God? Why don't I have that? Go seek His voice. Make it more important than your job. Make it more important than your TV shows. Make it more important than your eating and your breath. Lord, I cannot move out into the world today until I've sat with you. You do that, and I give you a 90-day guarantee (laughs) that you will see the miraculous happen. You will see God move things that you could never believe moved. You will see family members and neighbors and situations move, not because you sought them, but because you sought God. Let's do that today. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for teaching me to seek your voice. Thank you, Lord, that even in my rebellion, even in my apathy, you still pursue after us. You pursue it after me. Lord, I pray today, my request for this congregation is today that your spirit would fall upon them and that those who are seeking will hear your voice today. In Jesus' name.